Okay, priesthood of the cross. In John 19, 23, okay, we're, 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 we're deep into the passion narrative now in John 19. Okay, priesthood of the cross here. It notes that his tunic without, was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So what, John? Why do you even mention that? Okay. Why don't you mention there was a little plant growing at the foot of the cross over there? You know? Or a guy named Joe walked by just at that moment. Yeah. Why throw in this trivia? Oh, he had a seamless gar Okay, that's neat. Maybe it was more comfortable than other garments. Why even mention that? Okay. Well, there's only one other reference to a seamless garment in ancient Jewish literature. And that's in Josephus when he's describing, get this, the garment of the high priest. The high priest is indeed adorned with a vestment of blue color. This also is a long robe reaching to his feet. Now this vesture was not composed of two pieces, nor was it sewed together upon the shoulders and sides, but it was one long vestment so woven as to have an aperture for the neck. Okay. One piece garment. So when it refers to Jesus' tunic, the seamless tunic, it is high priestly imagery. Okay. Jesus' is priest and sacrifice. Then it mentions that the, the soldiers didn't tear the tunic. They cast lots for, the, they cast lots for it. They you know, divide up his other stuff, but they, they would not tear the tunic. Now that's interesting because in Leviticus 21, verse 10, one of, the, one of the things that stipulates about the high priest, okay, the priest who is chief among his brethren, shall not ever tear his clothes. So it's the, the tunic not torn. Okay? Then after Jesus' uh, death, and this is now John 19, verse 39, we see Nicodemus uh, coming to him, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes to anoint the body. So we have the perfumed body of Christ. You know, who in the Old Testament had a perfumed body? Well, there, there is more than one, but you go back to Exodus 30, you find out that concerning Aaron, the high priest, and his sons, they're ordered to take the finest spices, including liquid myrrh, okay, and anoint Aaron and his sons with them. So the priests had this... They were perfumed bodies as they entered into, sweet-smelling bodies as they entered into the holy sanctuary to serve before God. Okay, again, in the next verse, they wrap him up in linen cloths with the spices, as was the burial close to the Jews. You go back to Leviticus 16, you find out what the high priest was garbed with. He shall put on the linen coat. He shall have linen breeches on his body. Be girded with a linen girdle. Wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. Linen, 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 linen. Is there anything about linen you don't understand? It's all linen. Okay, 100%. No cotton, no polyester. Heaven's no acrylic. That would really make you sweat. Okay, so he's wrapped in, li he's wrapped in linen, you know, again, evoking some of the imagery of the high priest. And then he's laid in, a to in the place where he was crucified, verse 41, there's a garden. In the garden, a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. Why do you even mention that, John? Why throw in this trivia? Okay. Folks, this is a virginal tomb. Tomb in which no man had ever laid. Okay, laid in the virginal tomb. You say, Dr. Bergsman, you're getting pretty far-fetched. Okay, hold on a minute. All right. Let me show you something. First of all, notice Leviticus 21, 13, 14. If the high priest marries, he shall take a wife in his virginity, a virgin of his own people, a woman with whom no man has laid. Okay. And you say, yeah, but it's a tomb, you know, and, and that's a woman, and how do you get the, the, uh, the connection there? Uh, well, there is actually in the Old Testament a fascinating combination of concepts that recurs more than once, and that is the relationship between the earth and the womb. Uh, the, the, the classic passage is Psalm 139. Look at Psalm 139, verse 14. We, everyone involved in pro-life ministry knows this verse. Psalm 139, verse 13, you formed me in my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Okay, so where are we made? We're made in our mother's womb, right? And God knits us together there, right? Okay, but go down two verses to verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Wait, oh, hold on. I thought you were made in your mother's womb. But the poetry goes on and says, no, I was formed in the earth. And what is a tomb other than a hole into the depths of the earth, right? Okay. Now, don't ask me to explain it, but that was just a Hebrew poetic concept. 
somehow the womb of the mother was representative of the womb of the earth, and there was a mystical relationship in their, in their minds between the two. So when I say the virginal tomb, okay, it's really not far-fetched when you understand the Hebrew slash Jewish background of this uh, that, that John is, is dealing with uh, as, he, as he writes about the passion of Christ.